Dr. John C. Nort is a respected orthopedic spine surgeon who has been in practice for over 40 years. He has dedicated his career to the specialization in the care and surgery of the spine. He focuses on back problems, spine disorders, fractures, and surgical revisions, placing him in a unique league of surgeons who thrive on treating the most challenging cases and returning his patients to a pain-free life. Based in Miami, Florida, Dr. Nord is a past president of the Florida Orthopedic Society. He also served as a professor at the University of Miami and currently operates at multiple hospitals in the area. Dr. Nord, however, has seen a dramatic shift in medicine over the past 20 years, and not for the better, but for worse. Dramatic increases in medical expenses, major reductions in reimbursement, and a major shift from independent physicians to hospitals controlling all physicians are some of the most significant changes seen. But one topic that has been considered taboo and is usually never discussed is the integrity of surgeons and how a surgeon decides if a patient needs surgery. What he reveals is shocking. Why would a surgeon perform a procedure that wasn't warranted? Most surgeons are employed or want to make enough money to justify for economically sustainable income. And if they work for a hospital, they have to do so many points in order to justify their salary each year. They're now not working for the patient anymore. They're working for the institution. So is it really money driven? It is money driven at this point in time. One of the areas Dr. Nord has taken a stand against is the overuse of MRIs or magnetic resonance imaging. MRIs can be a very important diagnostic tool in certain situations, but they can also make an incredible amount of money for hospitals and imaging facilities. Usually, MRI scans are easily misinterpreted and can result in misdiagnoses, leading to unnecessary or even harmful surgeries. Well, why are MRIs performed so often when someone has back pain? The MRIs are done usually to find out what's wrong. I practiced for 10 years before MRIs ever existed. We were able to figure that out. MRIs should substantiate what is clinically relevant. In other words, you have a drop foot MRI, it proves where the drop foot comes from. But to get an MRI on somebody just as a screening test is flawed and many doctors don't even take the clothes off of their patient or examine them anymore. So what happens is they assume what they see on the MRI is true. There's several papers out recently that demonstrate that 30 to 40 percent of normal people off the street have something you could surgically operate on on the MRI, but there's nothing wrong with the patient. Well, are MRIs necessary for surgery? They are if it's clinically necessary and clinically relevant. In other words, if you have a neurological problem, it helps the doctor find out where to go and what to do and the extent of what to do. Well, do hospitals and MRI facilities make money by performing these MRIs? Every day. Every day they do. Uh, the MRIs basically, uh, I've seen charges of hospital MRIs of four thousand, three, four thousand dollars $4,000. I characteristically order MRIs on a freestanding facility. It's $450, $500. It's a big difference. Are surgeons using MRIs to scare patients? They absolutely are. They, send, they heighten the anxiety of the patient, stating that they might even be paralyzed if they don't have the surgery real soon. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line is if, if, if they say that and the patient's in pain, they're gonna believe the surgeon. And that's, that's almost fraudulent, that's undue influence. It pushes the boundaries quite a bit. And who's the patient gonna trust? It's the doctor. And so the bottom line is if they don't trust the doctor, they need to go see somebody else. But if they do, they're gonna end up having a surgery. I see these all the time here in Miami. I have patients coming in who had a neck cervical spine MRI. Nothing wrong with him, he had a little numbness in his foot, but they ended up talking him into a surgery. He even went to New York and had a second opinion. I saw him, I said, you don't need a surgery. Well, are you saying that these MRIs are leading to unnecessary surgery? They certainly are, they certainly are, because they are being done as an image. There is no clinical relevance with many of these MRIs. In other words, there's no neurological problem. You can't operate or push on the MRI and say, does that hurt? These people are being coerced into doing surgeries 
and they're trusting the doctor and they're trusting the system. Mm, so why is a surgeon performing a procedure that wasn't warranted? Well, the reason they're performing an unwarranted procedure is because they think it's warranted because they're trying to make a living. They're trying to generate their relative value units. And if they don't do that, the administrator puts them in the office after six months, well, you're not coming up to what we want you to do. And do you think the administrator cares about whether the surgery is appropriate or not? No, absolutely not. I see that in hospitals all the time. The administrator runs the show. And I throw the hospital administrations under the bus completely because that's wrong. And the doctor is just a worker bee at this point. They're not in charge. They're not in charge of the sovereignty of the decision making that made American medicine famous for the last hundred years. They're now working for somebody else. So is it really money driven? Totally money driven. And unfortunately, if, uh, if, if it's not that way, they end up getting fired or let go. There's a number of patients, a number of doctors that have been let go from various institutions here in South Florida because they stood up to the administration, they stood up to the institution, they said, we're not going to do that. And then unfortunately, they get let go. And what's plan B? You've been to all this training, and then where are you going to go to make a living? So you're saying that hospitals are forcing doctors and surgeons to perform unnecessary tests and procedures and, and even surgeries? They're encouraged because that's how the hospital makes money. It's a giant business is all it is. And the more, more money they generate through the emergency room, CAT scans, MRIs, physical therapy, injections, hospital-based pain management, ordering tests, uh, physical therapy, uh, hospitalists, or just basically the same as ER doctors, except they're on the floor. They're all paid for. And the more tests they order, the more they generate. And like I've said earlier, they can generate five and now 10 times, 10 times what the doctor can make. So if the doctor makes 100,000, they can make a million dollars. The hospital can make a million dollars and pay the doctor a certain amount less. Well, at the same point, are private practice surgeons also performing these unnecessary procedures as well? They are, and they are, and they basically are getting referrals from other people, including attorneys at this point in time. Attorneys basically are sending patients to doctors who have poor, poor uh, uh, decision making, and if they can make the money based on the, uh, uh, the, the auto insurance for a slip and fall or car insurance, or some kind of a, of, a, of a liability insurance, if they can generate it, they can bill 10, 15, 20 times what the uh, uh, Medicare will pay. And that's why they do it. And if they get paid 50% of those cases, they make money. So the hospital, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, doctors who are doing those surgeries, and I review these records, they're doing unnecessary surgeries on most of these cases. Well, how can this be happening? Because of money. It's follow the money trail is all it is. The, the, uh, the attorneys don't really care about it. The, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, doctors can make the money and they go home. And that's just the way it is. Well, do you know where this is taking place? Right here in South Florida. And it takes place at, in Tampa, it takes place in Orlando, it takes place in Jacksonville. And the end result is we're not here arguing about how much money you're making or not making. My focus is on the patient and to, to, to to wrongfully operate on a patient and not help them if they're at the bottom of the barrel or the top of the barrel doesn't make any difference. If they don't have any money or they have money, doesn't make any difference. They have a family, they have a life, and there's no reason why they can't have decent medical care and appropriate medical care. Again, it goes to outcome versus income. The income takes precedent over whether or not the patient's going to do well or not. Okay, well, you're a surgeon, so wouldn't this make your, all your colleagues turn on you? I mean, are, aren't you putting your profession at risk? I have an altruistic way of looking at life, and I think that we need to take care of patients. That's what I was trained to do. If I wanted to make money, I would have gone into some giant business or the pharmaceutical industry or something. But the bottom line is we still have a responsibility to patients. And those doctors that don't are probably going to be upset with me. So I why do. are you coming forward? Because I feel for these patients. I really understand. I've seen disasters happen. I had one patient die because he had a surgery at one of the institutions here in Miami, and they had to close his jewelry store in Carl Gables eight or nine years ago because he had an excessive surgery that was not necessary. The reason I know about it, he was my patient. I knew what was wrong. They did an extraordinarily long surgery to justify the relative value units, and he died. And this is happening, but... Who knows? Who's going to make these people accountable? 
Who's going to understand what's going on? The doctors aren't going to come forward because they get their check every two weeks. Well, you mentioned this commonly happens in big institutions and large hospital systems, but who is protecting these surgeons? Unfortunately, silence is protecting them. It's just the silence. No doctor has the wherewithal to come forward and say anything. They don't want to be blackballed. They don't want to be, uh, ha have a negative influence. But I, I've reached a point in my life where I understand this is important. These patients are important. If this was my son, if this was you, if it was anybody here, this is important because if they're hurt by not one, not two, not three, not four, but four surgeries like Tiger Woods, they're out of work. They, you can disable a person with an excessive surgery. I had one patient came in who had a, a minor scoliosis. He uh, was a cop, worked for the police department. And they wanted to operate on an eight-hour surgery to fix his back. And I examined him. He had an arthritic hip. There was nothing wrong with his back. And he had his new hip put in by someone else. He's back working. And the bottom line is that had he had a major surgery, he would have been disabled the rest of his life, never would have gotten back to, 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 to being a law enforcement officer. I see this all the time. And it's who's to make them accountable? That's a very good question. I think organized medicine is not willing to touch it at this point. And I feel bad about that, either locally, statewide, or otherwise. I was president of the Florida Orthopedic Society three or four years ago. I've been on national boards understanding reimbursement. And it's a travesty what's going on out there, the control of medical reimbursement, the control of insurance companies, the control of hospitals is based on the, the health care lobby in Washington, D.C., which spends more money every year than aerospace, defense, gas, and oil combined. So they control the Senate, they control the House. There's no free market for medical care, so therefore two or three or four insurance companies dictate the reimbursement in each state. Alabama, until five years ago, had 91.5% Blue Cross Blue Shield. There's no competition there, and there's no ability to make that happen unless it comes from the top from Washington, D.C. Well, are you saying that all back surgeons are performing these unnecessary back surgeries? A, a, high percentage of, a high percentage of them are, and they're justifying the surgery by an MRI. Having practiced for 10 years before MRIs existed, I made decisions based on clinical findings. Do you have a wrist that's weak? You can't walk on your toe, can't walk on your heel? You can't do this, you can't do that? And then we do a study to prove that. An MRI, you don't have to examine, you just look at the picture. But like I said, the New England Journal of Medicine in 1994 and the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 1990, both had excellent articles talking about normal people off the street who had, had nothing wrong with them historically from their back. And so they did MRIs on them and 35 to 40 percent of them had something so bad you could justify surgery. And unfortunately, an unscrupulous surgeon will operate on that MRI and talk that patient through anxiety-provoking discussions. You're going to get paralyzed if you don't get it done. And they talk them into surgery, and then many times it does not work. Now where do you go? The money's been made. And that doctor is not taking care of that patient postoperatively. They send him to pain management. Pain is a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. I always give the analogy, if your car is in the parking lot and doesn't start, you don't go change the battery. You find out what's wrong with the car. And by the same token, they don't find out what's wrong. They do some definite things, but they don't do anything to prove where the pain is coming from. That's the difference between neurosurgery and orthopedic surgery. The famous golfer Tiger Woods recently came back after four spine surgeries and just won the Masters. Considered a miracle comeback by many in the media and around the world, Dr. Nort explains how actually the medical establishment failed Tiger Woods through incorrect diagnosis and wrong surgeries. Tiger Woods, the famous golfer, just won the Masters but had major back surgery and was even arrested for a DUI for being on pain medication. What happened from your perspective? Unfortunately, Tiger Woods was a poster child for a uh, surgery that is improper. Uh, he had a laminectomy in April of 2014, one in October 2015, another one in December of 2015, all of which failed. That type of surgery relieves leg pain. Unfortunately, the band-aid for fail is narcotics, and he unfortunately was a victim of uh, narcotic overusage. He eventually had a surgery done in Texas the following year, 
a fusion which resolved his problem. The correct diagnosis was finally made. Where the pain generator comes from is really important and that was not described by the neurosurgeon that did the first three surgeries. Neurosurgeons are electricians. They basically take care of pinched nerves. He never had a pinched nerve except on the MRI image. I know that's difficult to understand, but there's other reasons for pain. And fortunately, the fourth doctor in Texas resolved the problem, and he won the Masters. It's a success. But one should have to go through four surgeries to get to that point. Well, is that common, four surgeries? Many surgeries is common, unfortunately. There's lots of different reasons doctors will operate on patients. Uh, money is one of them. Reimbursement is one. Uh, it's, it gets to be a, a real multifaceted problem, which is the reason we're here today to talk about it. Well, one would assume someone as notable as Tiger Woods has the financial resources to get the best doctors, but it seems the health care system failed him. Well, it did fail him in the standpoint that it was not successful. One has to have a correct diagnosis and then a correct surgery performed. Unfortunately, a correct surgery, uh, if not done, relegates the patient to have to have a second third surgery or a third surgery. And unfortunately, that didn't happen with him. The, se the health care system basically failed him because in a proper, inappropriate or improper surgical application for the wrong diagnosis. It's like having your transmission fixed when the engine is bad in the car. It's just totally disconnected. Well, he was operated on three times by a neurosurgeon and ultimately an orthopedic surgeon or an orthopedic spine surgeon. What's the difference? Well, a neurosurgeon is a nerve doctor. They're like electricians. They take care of the pressure on nerve roots. An orthopedic spine surgeon is like the contractor. He's like a construction guy. He understands biomechanics. He understands fusion. He understands sources of pain that are different from neurological sources. And if one is trained to understand neurological sources based on a picture, an image, an MRI, then what happens is they misunderstand and the wrong surgery is done. And this didn't happen to him once, nor twice, but three times. You mentioned money. Money is an issue. Just because you have money doesn't mean you're educated. You go with it where you think it's gonna work. The tragedy here is if guy is, if this, if Tiger Woods was working and he was out of work for the next year and a half, he would lose his job, salary drops, marriages on the rocks. It becomes a major sociological problem in the United States when this is done inappropriately. Is this just happening in the area of spine surgery? Unfortunately not. I've seen this. I, I was a team physician for Gables High. I was team physician for the Dolphins. And I found out in the last, one reason I left that area is people were doing arthroscopic surgeries of knees, for instance. And MRIs on knees can show a torn meniscus when there's nothing really wrong with the patient. And so they justify surgery. And they pop in three or four or five arthroscopic surgeries. And what's easier for a patient? You put something in, you do the surgery, and they go home the same day. No downside, no hospitalization. And unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case. As a lot of people do not need arthroscopic surgery. I have a friend of mine who has a cardiac issue, and he was in the hospital, and they wanted to put a an arteriogram and, an art and a, a cardiac stent. And he asked him if it was medically necessary and they said no. And he's six months out. He never had any enzyme changes. He never had anything happen. But the people that are employed by hospitals are focused on generating an income level to, to facilitate the point system that they're dealing with. And it's, I call it undue influence. It's talking people into stuff that doesn't have to be done. This probably goes across the board in all specialties to some degree. It's not my area to decide that, but I just know the way it's running right now. And if you put money in front, people are going to do what they have to do. There's not a lot of restraint anymore. And if you can talk someone into it, they'll do it. Tens of thousands of times each year, patients are wheeled into the nation's operating rooms for surgery that isn't necessary. A USA Today review of government records and medical databases finds patients fall victims to predators who enrich themselves by bilking insurers for operations that are not medically justified. Even more turn to doctors who simply lack the competence or training to recognize when a surgical procedure can be avoided either because the medical facts don't warrant it or because there are non-surgical treatments that would better serve the patient. The scope and toll of the problem are enormous, yet it remains largely hidden. The costs of unnecessary surgeries touch consumers and taxpayers in ways most never imagined. 
Medicare, Medicaid, and their private insurance counterparts spend billions of dollars on operations that shouldn't be done, draining healthcare dollars that could go to far better use. The pressures are real. Doctors' income can hinge largely on the number of surgeries they do and the revenue these procedures generate. Those numbers also can determine whether doctors get privileges at certain hospitals or memberships in top practices. There is no way to know what portion of unnecessary surgeries are related to these more subtle pressures as opposed to poor training or fraud.